You're listening to The Practical Wealth Show with Curtis May. All right, guys. Hey, welcome to another episode of The Practical Wealth Show. So I have a great guest to you did, uh, today, Mr. Andrew Miller. And he's an entrepreneur, consultant. He's a sales expert. And think about this. Are you a current franchise owner wanting to diversify with the perfect opportunity to create a perfect opportunity or you're a corporate refugee <laughs> looking for a path to financial freedom, or maybe, just maybe, you're considering dipping your toe into the world of franchise ownership, and you would just like some more information about the space. If any of these apply to you, Andrew's the man to talk to, and we are lucky to have him on the Practical Show Wealth Show with us today. Andrew, welcome to the Practical Wealth Show. Curtis, thank you for the kind word, sir. It's uh, good to be here today. Yes, it's good to have you. So we're kind of, I think the title of the show is going to be The Rise of the Tech Franchise. I like okay? it. I like and because um, that's the area he's working with, but I want to take a step back. So first of all, tell him what I didn't tell him and, uh, you know, what got you into this space. And then I want to kind of talk about, you know, how you help people get into the space. Sure, sure. So real, real quickly, just a bit about me. I grew up in Scotland for 25 years. Did a master's degree in sports science. Worked in the sports industry back in Scotland. Worked for universities back in Scotland in the sports industry. Uh, moved here five years ago. My beautiful wife's American. The reason I moved over to sunny Orlando, Florida. She was born and raised in Orlando. So, um, in terms of the U break I fixed though, I had a what? Sorry, that's better weather in Scotland. Uh, Scotland's <laughs> rain, rain and snow. It's a beautiful <laughs> country to visit, but it's uh, it's very cold this time of year. Um, so, uh, you break, I fix. What intrigued me was a friend from church. He's the controller for the company. He invited me to an event where um, it was an annual owners meeting, and they were looking to expand our department in the sales uh, team. One thing that really caught my attention was there's no brand in Europe that does electronic repair. Like when hmm. you think of repair, it's usually for most people, I have to send my phone, my laptop, my tablet to somebody who maybe he's in a mall. You don't really know the company. It's usually an indiv individual, um, we call them mom and pops in our space and mm -hmm. nothing wrong with that, but there's usually some, I think, pause of, can I trust the device? All my credit card information's on there. It's very close, this device to me personally. So having a brand recognition in the US and Canada, which is you break, I fix. We just opened our 600 store this week. I think it gave a lot of customers uh, a lot of confidence that I, you know, they're going to be there for the long run. I can drop mm -hmm. my phone off my TV and it's backed not only by you break, I fix, but it's backed by their partnerships that we have with Samsung, Google, you know, household names like Verizon, HP. So that intrigued me that there was a young tech company that kind of grasped the market share and were expanding rapidly Two, I also have just always liked technology and being a millennial, I just turned 30 a couple of months ago. I always like seeing new TVs come out. You know, AI is being worked on right now. There's a ton, right. of, um, ton of articles with Bill Gates talking about, you know, I think by 2025, 20, about 20% of households will have some sort of AI equipment in their house. So we love being that kind of go-to innovative company that works on these devices. Well, let's, so let's talk about franchising then. You know, there's, tell, tell, why franchising as a business opportunity, maybe, yeah. you know, what, what do you like about it and what do you think is a, is a good fit for? Yeah, great, great question. So whether you're looking at franchising for the food space, which is obviously probably one of the biggest spaces in the franchise world, whether it's in the automobile industry, health, whether it's insurance for us, obviously the tech space, electronics. For us, I think one thing that's really attractive about franchising is that the built-in support system is one. Mm -hmm. I think to having a company or a franchise that has a proven model. So not only do they have the support, like what is their model? Like are owners adding new territories to their markets, usually a good sign of a healthy ecosystem in that franchise. Mm -hmm. And we, we encourage every prospect to talk to at least two or three owners when they come on board and do their, uh, you know, due diligence with the brand. And I also, I like to call it the playbook. I'm a big sports guy, so I'm sorry for the, the reference, but mm -hmm. having somebody who has been there for, I would say at least three to five years, got a proven model and not only have corporate stores that have a foundation, but from corporate stores, they've offered it as a franchise system. 
Um, I think the playbook is key. You know, just follow the playbook, copy it instead of doing it yourself. By the way, if you if you learned it yourself, hats off to you. I think that's awesome. If somebody's like, hey, I've got a, a thought here, a concept, um, I would always just put a little question mark on it. Is is that already in the space? Is there a lot of com- competition with the idea you're going to be applying? Mm-hmm. Make sure you have a lot of wise counsel around you if you're going to apply your own concept in the marketplace. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the key is, yes, you should be in business, but if you can have a, a, a system, then you really just got to go to work and attract customers, but you already have the a business model that where they've worked out the kinks or spawn and you can add your own flavor to it Curtis mm-hmm. as you know mm-hmm. you know I know you're with you you I think you've been doing this you've been around the block for sure in business sir so I think I think having somebody who's been in the position before I guess has got the scars to yeah. show it oh just, I have just those. copy their play <laughs> just copy their play <laughs> <laughs> yes exactly listen I swipe and adapt or, or I don't like, I always say, well, I have no original thoughts. So I don't, what do they say? You can tell the pioneers because they have the arrows in their back. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, and so, and so I think a lot of times you have, it depends on the person. So if you are like a, uh, I heard Tony Robbins call these people artists where you just got to create new stuff. Franchise is probably not for you. You need to be coachable. Would that be accurate? <laughs> you know. Yeah, this this is definitely. I think you you bring up a great point, Curtis. I think franchising is all about just like having a close friend. It's about relationship that you trust them. They have your mm-hmm. back. We have mm-hmm. your back. You know, I guess the vetting process. They go through an application process. They also get a chance to meet us, whether it's right. virtually or in person, right. and just get to know the culture, the you know, the corporate leadership, who would be you'd working with. But yeah, I think I think in any life aspect, being I, I've always heard the two L's. You have the the leader L on the front, you're a leader, but also having the L play as a learner on the back, having those yeah, two yeah. combinations, it's always being humble enough to say, you know what, I maybe don't know all have all the answers. So we have, I would say at least 30% of our owners are entrepreneurs that have come on board, never had a franchise before. But Curtis, you 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 worded it perfectly. They were coachable in the entrepreneur spirit and when they joined us how would somebody explore you know so let's say they're you're exploring and you help them explore like is this franchise stable like you know and and i'm uh you know the system's there how how does one like kind of evaluate that yeah there's 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 a few steps and and i always tell prospective franchisees i'm working with um as they go through the the, to your point, the learning stage of the brand is, mm-hmm. again, whether it's you break, I fix whatever franchise opportunity you're do, doing a deeper dive into. Um, we have an initial call where we spend about an hour discussing the questions each prospect has, just fairly high level. What's the mm-hmm. cost? What's the initial investment look like? What's the support training, you know, marketing? Uh, we have, as I mentioned earlier, quite a few partnerships that send customers to you. What does that look like? How do I see a customer? What's a daily uh, you break, I fix, uh, look like every day operationally. Mm-hmm. So then the next step is we have a virtual discovery day and um, where we set, spend about three to four hours on a, unfortunately a Zoom call. I'm sorry if you have Zoom fatigue, like a lot I, of people do. Know. We take even a deeper dive and we show you everything from our financials with stores, the return of investment with you break, I fix stores, uh, the training, our software system. And then I, as I mentioned, always encourage a prospect, which I'm sure they would do, you know, connect with owners in your local state, connect with local owners in different states if you want, have a family member, maybe a, maybe a mentor read through the franchise disclosure mm-hmm. document, mm-hmm. have an attorney review it, make sure you understand, you know, our expectations and your expectations. Um, but there's a f- minimum 14 day cooling off period, which I love mm-hmm. with our franchise. So when we meet someone for the first time, there is a, a, a over two week cooling off, which means Um, we just get to know each other a lot more detailed. Uh, We like to date someone before we marry them is the core. Right. right. And so should you on the other end, right? If you're, if you're looking at a franchise, you know, you don't have to get married on the first date. (laughs) Correct. Yeah. Take, take your time doing your, doing your research. Right. Cause hopefully it's going to be a long marriage. So you want to, you know, uh, so let me give me three, four, five tips for, 
prospective uh, franchise owners? Three to f- three, four, or five tips. I like that question. Um, and I guess to just make sure I'm, I'm peeling back the onion here for your listeners, are you asking about prospective franchisees that are coming on board and looking at franchising? Are you asking about an owner that's in this system and says, hey, what should I look out for? What should I maybe avoid? What hmm, I- you know what? That's a good Now yeah, I hadn't even thought about it. I was thinking about <laughs> prospective, but... Well, let's say perspective because I don't okay. know how many people our listeners already have a franchise. Sure. So I, I'm going to I'm going to keep it from the perspective of I'm looking, you know, I'm a corporate refugee or yep. I'm looking to, uh, you know, pursue yeah, my you're... dream. I, and I might not want to even leave my job right away, but I want to have, an, you know, another revenue stream. So I would, first of all, go online and there's mm-hmm. over 4000 opportunities on the IFE website. Hmm. which just has all franchise opportunities in the U S and mm-hmm. you can actually click different topics. Like for example, you know, automobile industry. Mm-hmm. So I would say one is take a kind of a 30,000 view of franchising. You know, let's just take this baby steps at the very start. And um, I would say step two is once you've narrowed down your options is to um, look online at the industry. So let's say you're looking at Dunkin' Donuts. I would type in Dunkin' Donuts. You know, what's the industry look like right now? The food industry. And just mm-hmm. gather your own foundation of knowledge of what the industry looks like. at just a super high level. Because mm-hmm. that usually will narrow down your interest. So I say that's point two is just start to get deeper. Once you've narrowed down maybe three, four, maybe less, maybe more franchise opportunities that you're like, I like these. These are really intriguing to me. If right. they're not intriguing to you, don't just I'm sure that people won't waste their time, but just don't even give it a second thought. Make sure that you're like, this really opportunity excites me. And now, you don't have to be super passionate about fixing phones, TVs, laptops with our industries, but being passionate about customer service is huge for us. And if somebody comes on board and says, I don't really care for customers too much, um, we'll, we'll really early on just be super transparent and say there's probably a better opportunity. That's the right fit. Right. Um, <laughs> so once you know that, hey, their core mission statement for this brand, I would mm-hmm. say step four is mm-hmm. to take a deeper dive and have a conversation with that franchise specialist, whoever it is with the team, and understand the brand more. And I would say the last step is to take kind of that, that bigger dive and go to a discovery day with that company, meet meet maybe an owner with the brand locally, have a coffee with them, and you know have a call with them and just understand what their thoughts were. And you know, I, we're in a time now. I think with people are probably fed up hearing the word pandemic, but what does the industry look like during before the pandemic? What's it like, you know, end of 2020? What does it look like? You know, sales? How's yeah, you know, that's a, that's a, it's funny. I just, I, I was doing a mastermind call and I challenged people to say, well, what they list out, just think for a second and list out, you know, what are 15, 20 things that you can do to protect your business or your personal economy? Yeah. Uh, it, you know, um, if, if there's another pen, you know, so they already set precedent that, okay, well, we're going to shut things down, you know, which is that constitutional or not. That's, that's you know, I'm not going to go there. But <laughs> <laughs> so how would this perform? Because, because I want to let look for, because I want to segue into like, there's a big universe. Like I would never do food because that just restaurant is like long hours, you know? So I like the whole idea of the, the rise of the tech franchise. Okay as a what not not a market but a segment of yep. the other fran- of, of the franchise industry sure. and then how would so that so it's two questions i'm sorry because i'm no no you're good I'm fine. why the techie why do you like the techie why well, i think we should look at a tech franchise and then uh how would this perform in a pandemic situation because i think you have to i think you have to um think strategically you know offense and defense you know so what's your defensive strategy will this perform who's performing well, what industries perform well, if this happens again, is yeah. how I try to think about stuff and try to get people to think about stuff and ask themselves hard questions. Yeah. Yeah. Great, great questions. And I'm glad you brought up both of them. So first off, why, why the tech industry? I think a big reason we have owners from other franchise brands, we have a lot of owners with 45% to be exact from the likes of McDonald backgrounds and um, Papa John's owners with over a hundred hair salons in California that have diversified their portfolio and invested in U-Break I fix for the last five, six, seven years since franchising. I guess to quote a lot of them, the tech industry is young. 
So you're looking at an industry that's not been maximized out yet. It's not at full capacity. It's at the, it's kind of a ground level franchise opportunity. I mean, you're looking at an industry that Steve Jobs launched the Apple in 2007. Mm -hmm. I mean, you look at an industry that really birthed over the last 12 to 13 years where a lot mm -hmm. of franchise industries are 40, 50, 60 years old. We're in the very early kind of um, growth stage. Mm -hmm. I think that's one. I think number two is just looking at tech technology. The average household right now has about 12 to 14 devices that are worth value. And I'm, I can see Kurt is on our Zoom call. You're looking around the house, looking at devices yes. um, in your living room <laughs> or your office. Yes. I mean, I always tell prospective franchisees, it's not just a smartphone that we see come into our store every day. And we also have over 550 vans in operation that drive to people's houses in places mm -hmm. of business. Mm -hmm. We call it, we come to you repair. Anyway, Having devices that are always being worked on with Samsung, they're always different devices coming out and they're becoming, which is crucial to see, more expensive. Yes. People want to have an option of repair versus replace. We, we do studies every year and people still find that they fall into, I just want to get my phone replaced, which gives us a huge opportunity that there are millions of customers out there that do want to get a repair because the number one reason they want to come in is the value proposition of repair versus replace. And we could definitely explore if people are interested in more detail about insurance that we work with. We work with a company called Assurion. And um, probably the most exciting update is we were acquired last year by the largest insurance company in North America, Assurion. Incredible company. They do a lot of underwriting and warranty. So wait, they acquired... Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, so yeah, partner. talk about distribution, you know, in yes. terms of, uh, um, cause they already have it. So now they're going to, all right, let's send you to, uh, our store and we local store to fix this for you or come to you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's, that's, that's a biggie. And so yeah. while we evaluated this, see, see, Y'all have to know how to evaluate business. So if this big company have, okay, look, we, we need to be in this game. Let's partner with them. And then um, what I'm hearing is there's other people. A lot of your customers are people that are already our franchises. So they want to, there's a difference between what I call vertical diversification, horizontal diversification, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you own a, this is old school, but a, clo a, a, a dry cleaners and you put a tailor shop on the second floor, that's a different business, but it's vertical diversification. Sure. Yeah. But if you buy an ice cream parlor, that's horizontal diversification. So you're yep. diversified. And so this is, if they're in McDonald's, I'm in food. Well, now I'm going to have some horizontal diversification and get into the tech space. And so that's, I, I, I see that. That's brilliant. Yeah, actually. It's a great analogy. And I, I think that's very key for people. I think nowadays to have different, different hands and different parts yeah. across yeah. different industries. So how would it, how do you project it? You know, in a well, you don't have to project because this happened. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we, in, in, a, in a pandemic uh, world, a yes, shutdown world. Yes, sir. So it's November um, 2020 as we speak. Is it the 10th today, I believe? Yep. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So since last November, year over year, we're actually ahead of our sales. And obviously last year, nobody knew what the pandemic was coming, mm -hmm. obviously. So we are uh, very, very fortunate to be in the industry we are. And I, and I say that obviously with, with all all things in mind with other industries that uh, I feel for. Um, I talk with owners from other franchises and some of them are obviously getting beat up a little bit more than others. Mm -hmm. With us, mm -hmm. I think electronics are seen as a necessity. Um, yeah. you know, nobody Absolutely. has a landline nowadays. Everybody has their smartphone. So knowing that if you break your device or your TV or you need a battery replacement or your Roomba breaks, we can fix all those devices in the house. It just gives us a lot of diversity when it comes to different devices we fix. So if I'm a, not a techie person, because it's not about, buying a franchise is not about you being able to do this stuff because you're not going to be fixing the, the, the phones or the tablets or, 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 or is that part of it? You're going to learn how to do it. I guess you somebody will. calls out, you need to know how to do it. <laughs> no, so you don't need to, over 50% of our owners have no repair background. This is a really common question I get yeah. every day from prospective yeah. franchisees. Mm -hmm. we, 
we typically have about four to 5,000 people a year inquire through our website. And mm-hmm. I would see 80% of people ask me, do I have to have this background? Because that was right. a question I had right. years ago was surely you need to have some sort of Facebook or Google or NASA background for repair. Mm-hmm. And this, this skill set, it's a lot of, it's a lot of plug and play learning the skill set. Mm-hmm. It's a, I mean, my first job was working at McDonald's when I was 15, 16 years old. It's more maybe advanced than something hamburgers, but it's not as challenging as people think. It's fairly, fairly quick to learn. Um, one device, you can transfer that skill set to another device. Maybe the screen's bigger on a different device. Maybe the screws go in a different place. But right. long, long story short, we had a six weeks training course at the start for an owner as well to understand everything. So that they can just hold, I think, their team to some some level of transparency and accountability so they know what's going on every day in their store. But yeah, most of our techs, they start off with customer service background in our stores. Having a repair background is, sure, it's, it's great, but we can train that all day long. Right. Training you can't train someone, people being too nice to people. You, That's hard to write. You stole the words in my mouth. Right. right? You, you spawn. <laughs> Right. So <laughs> that's that's good stuff. So I'll just do my favorite catch all in case I miss anything. What sure. didn't I ask you that I should be asking? I think uh, I mean, you've asked some, I mean, really good questions that we get asked every day as a team when it comes mm-hmm. to franchising. I, I guess in terms of if this is of interest to anybody, if this has kind of mm-hmm. piqued anyone's interest. I would highly encourage you to go on youbreakifix.com. Uh, forward slash franchising or they can connect with me curtis it's a dot miller it's m-i-l-l-a for apple r at you break i fix and um, dot com and would be more than happy to send them some literature and information on the company that's good yeah so i was gonna lead you out you know my next question was how should they get in touch with you you said that so we'll put his information in the show notes and so guys you want to research like you should be always looking like you're all running your own little hedge funds you guys see yourself so uh buffett is like berkshire halfway all they do he saves money and he looks for opportunities so you've got to get good at you know uh kiyosaki says financial literacy is the ability to read numbers so when you're analyzing the questions has you're looking at the financials you look at the market you look at the area that you want to be in you know, and they've done those studies to make sure there's enough traffic to that to can service you and you know that kind of stuff. Now, you still got a market, they'll help you with that, but there's stuff you gotta do. So it's not just go there and open up and you know, the money's just gonna pour into the in, into the <laughs> I wish <laughs> you it was that do some work, but it's it's uh uh but you know there's there's opportunity there. Technology doesn't spoil. <laughs> right. And, uh, you know, you don't have to throw out bad buns or worrying about, you know, people giving up too much catch up. You know, it's it's a great, uh, great point. You yeah. know, that 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 kind of stuff. So that's uh, I like that aspect of it. And uh, I would never buy a food franchise. I was like, no, that's 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 just too much work. For, for Can purpose. I say one other thing yeah. real quick? As you, this um, I mean, we've had owners with a lot of food franchise owners in our system. I think a big reason is the hours of operation are very attractive to their team and um, you know getting getting a millennial maybe to to wake up at five in the morning can maybe have its challenges you know right. they, you know i think for most for most people and i say that for myself i'm not a, yeah. i'm not a morning person if, right. it's, if it's still dark outside the sun's not come up yet you know don't ask me to to, to wake up right, so right. <laughs> our our hours are 10 in the morning till seven and monday to saturday 12 till five on sunday or it's it, to your point curtis you know what the food doesn't talk to you our inventory doesn't talk to you after 30 days it's inventory doesn't go out stale right. and right. it it's a it's a smaller operation stores are typically about 800 to a thousand square feet and mm-hmm. um, you know you don't go home smelling i guess of grease every day which is i think right. a, an attractive part of maybe Plus, some so i i hear like a less staff smaller square footage so my rent is lower my utilities are lower see because you see i come from a brick and mortar world so when i hear oh i'm gonna open up a location i'm you know there's you gotta heat it light it you know whether somebody comes in or not. So you want to have that to be as efficient as possible. As so possible. those, those yeah. are, you know, cause the lower your overhead, the more money in your bottom to your bottom line. And so, you know, that, that's why, I mean, you got to understand the numbers of your, of your business because yes, you're in business become financial independent. So this is a vehicle uh, or one of the vehicles as, as you know, to the people that, that, that Andrew works with that diversify to get you to, we call it in our system being a cash flow near, right? 
And so the four asset classes are business, real estate, paper, and commodities. So today we just had a, uh, we have just explored the asset class called business with uh, opportunity called franchising with the sub opportunity in the tech world for franchising. So I just want to position this, this conversation. So Andrew, listen, thank you so much. This has been, uh, this has been great. And I uh, hope y'all go out there, call him, find out some more information, go to their website, check it out. There's a, uh, they're national. Yep. U S and U S and Canada. U S and I was going to say in Canada. And uh, so, you know, might be a good fit for, for you or you and a partner or whatever. So take a listen. And um, hey, thanks again, Andrew. Thank you, Curtis. Thanks for listening to Practical Wealth. To access the show notes and resources, go to practicalwealthshow.com. To get your questions on the show, go to practicalwealthshow.com. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before you make any investment decisions, consult a professional. This show was copyrighted by Practical Wealth. Written permission must be granted before syndication.